And we're live in five, four, three. Welcome back, everybody, to INE's discussion on segment routing. In this section, we're now going to start to look at the difference in the control plane specifically between label distribution protocol and the new variation, which is going to be segment routing. Okay, so to recap where we're at, what we have is this topology that is pre-built. Let me go ahead and, and clean this up a little bit. We have six routers that are in the core of the MPLS topology, which are routers 1, 2, 3, and then XR 1, 2, and 3. Now, to tell you the truth, I have not done a ton of research into the CLI for segment routing because there's not that much support yet that is out there. The only thing we realistically need to do is just to turn segment routing on and to let the IGP do the label assignments. So we're going to look at this from a small scale. Hopefully this actually works. If it doesn't work, I'll come in and fill it back in later once I figure out what the actual syntax is. But hopefully it should be behaving. The only thing I know is that last time I tried it in virtualization, there was some virtual issue. It's not a hardware issue. If we had actual ASR 9Ks today to play with, we would be fine. Okay, so this is an issue of the virtualization within the viral uh, platform. Okay, so what I am going to do to make sure for 100% that we're not yet running into this issue is I'm temporarily going to take our regular iOS boxes out of contention. Router 1 and router three, I'm simply going to remove them from the topology. Okay, the way I'm doing this from a CLI point of view is super simple. Okay, this is why I have this topology set up like this from a learning point of view. You obviously wouldn't use this topology in production, but it's great for just playing around with all the protocols. Okay, so what we can do here is we're gonna go to router one and go to global config, interface gig two, and simply shut it down. Okay, that main interface is what connects to the virtual switch. If I delete that interface, it's not routing. Okay, so interface gig 2 on router 3, likewise, shut down. If I now go to router 6, and we look at the show IP route for 7777, I technically still have multipath, but I should see either one of two things, that this is going to be aged out, or that ultimately it's going to be using the same exit PE out of the network, which is going to be 11, 11, 11, 11. The issue I'm currently facing is that I just shut the main interface down. I didn't have any high availability protocol running like BFD because that's not supported in virtualization. It's not supported in viral. Normally what happens is that you lose link status. The other end will automatically know right away, either because we're physically connected at layer one or we're running something like BFD in order to do fast link down detection. In our case, we just have to wait. Okay, we're waiting right now for the control plane to react, which specifically would be router 5, realizing that, hey, I no longer have an OSPF neighbor on gig 2.15. So if we go over to router 5, okay, it says now the neighbor is down. Okay, if we show IP route 47777, we should see that now this path changed said previously we were exiting via router one. Now we're exiting via 11, 11, 11, 11, which in this case is XR1. Okay, so let's see, did this actually change anything in our data plane transport though? Can I still reach the destination? Yes, I can. Okay, if we now do a trace route, we're still using the MPLS network. We're going from router six to router four. Okay, and let's do this on the other diagram here. So specifically our data plane flow is now going from 6 to 4, from 4 to 11, 11 to 11.2, 11 which is this direction, then 13.13, .13, which is this one. Okay, that should be 2, 13, 13, that's correct. And then finally over to router 7. Okay, so currently still we have an iOS box. Okay, technically it's iOS XE iOS XE that is running as a P router, and we have another iOS XR box here that's also running as a P. Okay, specifically, these are our route reflectors. Route reflector in this case is in the physical transit path. This would be more indicative of a unified MPLS design as opposed to a real practical design where your route reflectors are out of band. Okay, that's not relevant to our discussion here. But what this is just showing is that we are doing label switching through the core. Hey, data plane's working, right? Okay, so let's now talk about, well, how did you get this information? 
how does XR1 know what it is specifically doing when this packet enters into the data plane? Okay, so let's now look at, well, what does that packet look like? On router 6, we're sending the pings out, and then they're ultimately getting towards router 4 and then to XR1. Okay, so let's go back to our packet capture. Okay, let's do this. Let's do a ping, and we're going to do this ping, let's say repeat, let's send 100 packets. Okay, so it should be clear in the packet capture if it's this flow, because I did it just 100 times in a row. Okay, notice that back on the viral box, the traffic captures are now running false. The reason why is I sent too much data. There's some sort of upper limit. Once the file gets this big, it stops writing the file. You can change those options, just I left the defaults. Okay, so what this means is simply I'm just going to trash the old captures, just delete them, and we're just going to create a new one. Okay, so under traffic captures, again, we're trashing them. Okay, there are faster ways to do this. This is just the way that I'm doing it. I'm going to check now on router 2, gig 2, and on XR2, gig 0, and XR1, gig 0, and XR3, gig 0, and router 7, gig 2. I'm capturing all at once. Okay, the simplicity of this is just is going to give me one zip file. It will be all separate PCAPs behind the scenes, but I want to see this technically from multiple places. Okay, you can either do that in this screen, just check the different interfaces you want to capture, okay, or you could do it in the previous one. The only difference now is that you need to give this some group name, it doesn't matter, ASDF. Okay, you, need to, you need to do that before it lets you check uh, create in viral. Okay, and this, uh, depending on when you guys are watching this, okay, there's supposed to be a major revamp of viral. I'm not going to talk about those details. I'll let them talk about those details. But this is release 15145. This may look majorly different depending on when you guys are looking at viral. This is in March of 2019. March 24th is when I'm recording today. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is, again, send packets in the data plane. We ping. We're now going to look at the capture. Okay, I want to look at the capture from XR1's point of view. So under my simulation, we go to the simulation, we go down to traffic captures, and we download it. Okay, again, this goes to my download manager in a different window, so you can't see it normally. Just Chrome or whatever your browser is would download that. But what I see on my end is asdf.zip. Okay, here's WinRAR, so that inside the zip file you can see the individual PCAPs. Okay, again, what, where we wanted to look at the flow here was from XR1. So XR1, let's open this up and then search for ping. Okay, not actually, no, not ping, sorry, ICMP. Okay, so these are all those pings, 100 pings. Okay, it's obvious, right? So let's look at just any of them. Okay, let's look at the ping request. Ping request originally came from the source MAC address, Frank Apple 16, 3 Edward 602, Apple 89. Okay, I want to know who is this? This should be the originator. We go to the CLI, we go to router 6, and we look at the show interface gig 2. And let's show interface gig 2, and let's pipe to include the BIA. Okay, the burn in address here is 6 Frank 91. That's not what we see here. Okay, so this was not the original source of this particular frame that we're looking at. Uh, where also I should be able to see this, uh, actually I missed a hint here, was the, was the VLAN ID. Okay, VLAN ID or the dot one q VLAN encapsulation of this particular frame is 411. If we look at the diagram, it means that this frame came from what link? And somehow, in the past three seconds, I just lost my pen. There it is. Okay. Uh, port 411. Okay. This is the frame that we're looking at here. Okay. So that's frame number one. Okay. We now want to look at what, does, what happened to this packet as it left the exit interface of XR1. Okay. So this is the frame regular IP coming in. So it's not yet MPLS encapsulated. Next should be the encapsulated frame. Okay, so look at what the source MAC address and destination MAC address were. From 2 Apple 89 was the source, destination was 4 Edward 29. If we go back to the diagram, that should be router 4 to XR1 link. We go to router 4, let's simply look at the 
show IP ARP. If the next hop of 10, 4, 11, 11, okay, which based on this output, it says it's on gig 2.4.11, okay, so that is the correct port. If we see that in that frame, the destination was 4 Edward 29, and the source was 2 Apple 89, which is us, we know exactly what link that was coming from. Okay, that's the point of the capture. Is not that you necessarily want all of this data from the virtual switch, but now I have a quick way to correlate this. Okay, I know that that individual frame came from router 4 going to router 11 based on the fact that the source MAC address is 2 Apple 89 at the end, going to 4 Edward 29. Okay, from 4 to 11. Okay, now let's look at the next frame. Next frame is coming from 4 Edward 29. Okay, 4 Edward 29 again was XR1. Okay, XR1's next hop is 1362, but we're now label encapsulating this. If we go to XR1, we need to figure out, well, who has that MAC address on the other end of the link? Okay, I can technically tell this just by looking at what inside the capture because I know what my topology looks like. If we go back to the diagram, we would see that exiting XR1, you currently only have two options. You could go on subinterface 1112, or you could go on subinterface 211. In this case, when we look at the data plane, data plane told us we went which direction? We went 211. Okay, because I'm simply using from a naming convention I used VLAN 211 as the encapsulation just to make the logic easier. Okay, it's between router 2 and node 11 in this case. So router 2 has loopback 2222, XR1 has 11, 11, 11, 11. Okay, so we now know that from a data plane point of view, the ping went from XR1 to router 2. It had two labels. It had 23 and it had 24010. Okay, this is the key. I now need to know that when the packet went that direction, okay, that was capture number two, it was being sent with two labels, 23, and underneath that, 24010. 24010. Okay, now router two receives this. We look at where it was forwarding towards. It was forwarding towards 1362, the last two bytes of the MAC address. 1362. Okay, we're now going to go to router 2, and we're going to, again, show IP ARP. 1362 is my interface on gig 2.11. Okay, that's me. So router 2 was the destination. It rewrote the frame, okay, because it's routing, right? Rewrote the frame. Destination now becomes what? Okay, well, we would have to look at what are the labels. So a packet is coming into us. The label destination is 23. Router 2 internally says, show MPLS forwarding table and show me what happens if I receive a packet input that has label number 23 on it. Okay, it says label number 23 means that I'm going to remove the top label from the stack or perform what we call the pin ultimate hop popping or the PHP process. So this is an optimization in data plane. We remove the last hop label one hop sooner. It means that the last hop only needs to do one lookup instead of two. Okay, but either way, the point being of this is that what the match in router 2's routing table was not the final destination. Okay, final destination, look at the packet. Destination 7777. That's not where router 1, or excuse me, router 2 thinks this is going. The only thing router 2 knows is it is exiting via 1313, 13, 13. That is the exit PE, which in this case is XR3. So router 2, in other words, it doesn't need to know the routes about 6666 or 7777 because we're hopping over them. We have an overlay tunnel, which is the MPLS tunnel. The underlay that router 2 established is also using MPLS but it's only using MPLS to switch between XR1 and XR3, between 11, 11, 11, 11, and 13, 13, 13, 13. Okay, we would see that for every single packet now that's going through the core. If we go to router two, actually first let's go to router six, and we're gonna do this ping, and we're just gonna let the ping keep going. Okay, repeat 9999999, timeout zero. Okay, just send the pings as fast as you can. 
Now from router 2's point of view, we're simply going to look at show MPLS forwarding table. And depending on the platform, okay, meaning the platform is virtual in this case, it may or may not tell us, are you actually using that label switch path? Okay, luckily, in our case, this is software switched, which means that it can log this for us. Okay, depending on your hardware platform, this is different. You cannot log every packet, every packet in hardware. Otherwise, you wouldn't be hardware switching. You would be software switching. Okay, but this is software. It's a VM. What I care about here is these two labels, 22 and 23. Okay, I technically don't need to look at the data plane encapsulation in our PCAP to figure out what LSP was being used. I just look at the counter. Okay, this shows me packets were moving between 12 and 13. Okay, and why were they moving between them? Well, it must have something to do with the next hop. Okay, specifically, if we were to look at the show BGP VPN v4 unicast, this is going to tell us VPN show BGP what? VPN v4 unicast for all routing tables, we would see what are the actual hops where I'm trying to label switch between. Okay, to get to 6666, you would be using 11, 11, 11, 11. To get to 7777, you would be using 13, 13, 13, 13. These are ultimately the only two label destinations I care about within the core, at least within this scope. Because we don't need to necessarily label switch towards router 2, not to itself. We just need to label switch over router 2. So technically, we only need two routes and two labels from an MPLS switching point of view, the loopback of XR1 and the loopback of XR3. But now the question becomes, well, how did I generate these routes to begin with? What was the underlying IGP? Now, in this case, I think the, the pre-built topology is a little bit confusing. So let's go ahead and see how was it actually learning this. Okay, because this topology is an example I use in a CCI service provider boot camp. So it's kind of a problem topology on purpose. So on XR1, let's just look at show IP protocols. Okay, what IGPs are we running? Okay, we're currently running IS to IS. Okay, IS IS process number one. And we're routing on these particular interfaces. Okay, so those are the interfaces that are in the core of the network. Okay, we're also running OSPF process 100, blah, blah, blah. But the key is that this is the core protocol. Okay, core protocol in this case is ISIS. Okay, so we're going to check on XR2. It should be likewise running ISIS, show ISIS neighbors. We have an adjacency with router 2. We have an adjacency with XR1. Okay, currently we don't have an adjacency with XR3. The reason why is that these guys are running OSPF. But what I'm going to do for this example is we're just going to turn OSPF off in the core and I'm going to replace it with ISIS. Because normally you only have one protocol in the core. You don't have multi-protocol IGP. That's only for purpose-built complexity in this, in this topology to show you it's not your normal case. You do not redistribute IGP in the core. You can run Unified MPLS, that's fine, but you don't need to redistribute. OK, so what I'm now going to do is we're going to go to XR3, and let's just look at the show run. And for those of you that are not very familiar with iOS XR, this can also be helpful. So let's just show run, and let's go through its config. OK, so at the top, we start with our virtual routing and forwarding instances. OK, this is the customer's routing table. So we create the routing table. We give it what we call the route target. Okay, the route target, you can think of this just like a route tag. If the tag matches, you are part of the same VPN. So anyone else who is importing and exporting to colon 2, they're part of this same site. Okay, the other way we could see this would be to go to our other edge router, XR1, and simply show run. We should ideally see for routing table B as in Brian, we're likewise importing and exporting to 2. Okay, so for those of you who already know MPLS Layer 3 VPN, self-explanatory, right? Whatever you export, that's what I import. Whatever I export, that's what you import. End result, full mesh of connectivity. Okay, so anyways, we create the routing table. Then what do we do? Okay, we assign it to the port. So under the interface, we have our VRF. We have our protocols. Okay, in this case, we're running dual stack V4 and V6. Then we have our control plane. A control plane in this case is OSPF. We're saying run OSPF on these ports, 
And when you do, also turn Label Distribution Protocol on, LDP. What this now means is if we look at the show IP OSPF neighbors, these should ideally be on a one-to-one -one basis to the show MPLS LDP neighbors. Okay, if we show MPLS LDP neighbors piped to include the ID, compare this to the OSPF neighbors, they're one-to-one. -one. I have an LDP and OSPF adjacency with router 2, likewise LDP and OSPF adjacency with XR2. Because the ultimate idea is that for every IGP route I have, I need a matching MPLS label. Okay, in reality, that's not the case. I only need the labels for the loopbacks, but in general case, LDP binds every route that you have as an IGP route. So if we look at the show IP route from XR3, we look at, well, hey, what am I learning from IGP? I'm learning these OSPF routes. I now create MPLS labels. Show MPLS forwarding table. Okay, in our case, this is even more specific because if we show run, we've done an optimization that says when you create labels, I only want you to create labels for what? I only want you to create them for your host routes. Okay, this would be more similar to the behavior of Juniper Juno S, where they only label loopbacks as slash 32 by default. You have to program it to say, hey, label the transit link. Now, I think this just goes back to Cisco legacy days where they made a decision saying, hey, we'll do LDP on a one-to-one -one basis. It just means that their default, they couldn't change it when they went past that. It doesn't mean that you need labels for the transit links, just that it doesn't behave like that by default. So in this case, iOS XR is now behaving more like Juno S. It says, I'm only going to allocate labels for the host routes. Well, what are the host routes, Brian? They are slash 32. What this means is that if we show IP route, pipe to include, sorry, show IP route, pipe to include slash 32, and show empty this forwarding table, these are now going to be on the one-to-one -one binding. So in other words, I do not have a label binding currently for the physical interface between XR1 and XR2 because I don't need that. I'm not label switching towards the transit interface. I'm label switching past it. I terminate on the PE. PE takes off the whatever labels it needs, looks at the payload, and then it forwards. So intelligence and MPLS lives at the edge just like in a VXLAN fabric, they're ultimately the same protocol, right? The only thing that's changing is our data plane format. With VXLAN, we're literally using the same control plane. We're using BGP. We don't call it VPN v4, we call it what? L2 VPN eVPN, but it's doing the exact same thing. Taking routes, turning them into BGP, marking some sort of membership. Okay, that membership is the route target. Okay, we see this on XR3 when we look at the routing table. Show route for IPv4 unicast for virtual routing and forwarding instance B. Or show route for VRFB, address family IPv4 unicast. Okay, I'm learning the prefix 7777-32 as an IGP route from the customer. I then turn this into a BGP VPNv4 route. So we show BGP, VPNv4 unicast, for 7777 slash 32, I need to say for what route distinguisher? This would be RD22, prefix is 7777 slash 32, and actually no, RD is what? Show VRF, RRD, show run VRF. Actually show run BGP. BGP is where the route distinguisher is denoted from a syntax hierarchy of uh, iOS XR, show run section BGP, Brian, I should have just said show run, right? Show run. Okay, under show run, route distinguisher, 13, 13, 13, 13, colon 2. So, iOS XR, please show me the BGP output for the address family, no, excuse me, yes, for the address family, VPN version 4, unicast, the route distinguisher is this. Okay, what is the prefix? The prefix is 7777 slash 32. I want to know when you originated this route from OSPF into BGP, what are the attributes you set? Okay, the attribute we really most care about here is going to be one of two things, the route target and the MPLS label. Okay, ultimately the label is what you infer everything from because the label is already pre-bound to the FEC is what we call it, the forwarding equivalency class. The router is not even doing a lookup on the loopback. It just looks at the label number. 
The loopback is for our point of view. That's how we're connecting the logic. Router's not really doing this. It understands MPLS. It says, hey, 24010, that's some entry I'm writing to the line card. But from our point of view, we need to think of this from a more logical point of view. Packet comes in, label destination is 24010. What does that really mean? It means you're forwarding towards this next hop from a layer three point of view on your CE link. So decapsulate, decapsulate MPLS to IP, forward to the customer. Point being is that, how was this control plane generated? This was generated by BGP because this is the end-to-end -end customer route. This is not the internal route that's talking about the loopback of the PE. This is saying, how do we do customer reachability? So the point being with segment routing is that we do not need to change this. Segment routing, yes, it is MPLS 2.0, 3.0, however you want to say this from a marketing point of view. But the key is that nothing is changing in the data plane, which means we don't have to touch the edge. We're not trying to upgrade the edge here. We're trying to upgrade the core. We're trying to simplify from the service provider's point of view. They're asking us the question, why do I need LDP? I'm already running OSPF. I'm already, I'm already running ISIS. I'm already running BGP2. Why do I need a third protocol in order to generate labels? Technically, you do not. It's just that, hey, we didn't think about that before, right? So we had a separate protocol to generate labels. Well, it's kind of redundant. It's not helping us at the end of the day because OSPF already advertised the IGB routes. Why not just let OSPF do that, right? That's what segment routing means. So if we look into the actual specification for segment routing, what it's really saying is, hey, this is an extension to OSPF. This is an extension to ISIS. Let's search ISIS segment routing because that's the control plane protocol we're going to be using in this example. Okay, using segment routing with ISIS. Okay, this is from Cisco and this is going to be for platform iOS XE. Okay, I don't know why it's not clicking that link. Uh oh. Oh, no, wait a minute. That was a PDF started to download. Okay, just uh, let's just say ISIS segment routing. Uh, let's say sitesisco.com, and this is see. There's there's really not much there's not much documentation even out there about this is what the problem is because the feature is basically brand brand new uh, as of now. So what I'm going to do is let's just open this PDF because that's what it gave it to me in um, instead of its uh, your normal just regular documentation format. Okay, so using segment routing with ISIS. We know that segment routing, well, technically, guys, no, we don't. You tell us that. Okay, we know that segment routing enables a node to select any path. This path is not dependent on a hop-by-hop -hop signaling technique through LDP or RSVP. Okay, it's saying you are using your own label distribution path. You're assigning the label. You are the LSP in the scope of segment routing. Okay, so we're not using label distribution protocol we're not using resource reservation protocol. We're going to use ISIS or OSPF. Okay, how are we going to do this? First, we need to extend the protocol. So it says that we need to, first off, make sure that we have the code. Okay, right? So whatever protocol that you're running, it says you need to make sure that you have these capabilities as defined per this RFC. Okay, so that's our key point here. I need to know what defines this. Integrated intermediate system to intermediate system extensions for advertising router information. Well, what router information are we trying to, to, trying to advertise here? It's MPLS traffic engineering. So what this is saying is that somehow we changed ISIS. We changed it so we give you more information. We don't yet need to talk about what is that information, just that the protocol now has that support. So this is what we're now going to do from the CLI. We're now going to take ISIS, make sure it's running everywhere, make sure we have IP connectivity. Then we look at how did we establish the labels. We're currently establishing them with LDP. Make sure that the data plane works. Once we get to that point, turn LDP off. See what happens. Do the customers still have reachability, yes or no? What's going on in the core? Then we turn segment routing on and see what the final result is.